was afraid of hawk. The first song that he sang is in honor of the buffalo. He said, Buffalo Nation, we need you. We're depending on you. Buffalo Nation, we're depending on you again. Today is a sacred day. So, Grandfather, hear my prayers. A century ago, when the American frontier officially closed, Fewer than a thousand bison roamed the Great Plains. A shadow of the enormous herds that once sustained native cultures from Canada to Mexico. The massacre of 60 million buffalo was the anchor of a Western policy that tamed the wildness of the plains. Kill off the herds, plow the grasslands into farms, and push the native tribes onto reservations. And I've always felt that there was something that was missing from here. And I grew up on this land right here. I guess my, my ancestors are buried here. Uh, these buffalo's ancestors are buried here. All the grasses, everything's native here. And that's the context that I always thought in from growing up here. And I, and I think I learned the significance of how all these things need to be here, the necessary. And that comes from a, a cultural understanding from his home on the Lakota Sioux Reservation at Cheyenne River. Fred Dubray grew up with a vision of renewal on the plains, where the horizon would once again be swept with bison herds and native cultures would flourish. After all, the buffalo are a symbol of our strength and unity, and that's how our particular uh, project all started out. It's not a new idea at all. I mean, it's thousands of years old. We recognize that, that as we bring our buffalo herd back to health, we also bring our own people back to health. And uh, that's what it's all about. In the spring of 1992, in a sterile, windowless Albuquerque hotel room, Fred Dubray took his vision to a gathering of tribes. I might want to bring buffalo home and make jerky and sell it to Japan. You might want to bring them home just to have them there and to use it within your community. Uh, Individually, our goals may be different, but as a whole, our goal is, is to get Buffalo back to the Indians again. The Northern Cheyenne were there, the Winnebago, the Apache, the Ute, the Crow, the Picaris Pueblo, and a dozen others. The Intertribal Bison Cooperative was born. It's a matter of moving together as a united group, trying to better ourselves, and trying to take something back that was stolen from us. So I consider this basically an uh, Indian war party. For Carl Soshi, the effort begins with a herd of six and a small pasture on the edge of the Picaris Pueblo in northern New Mexico. But this is not where his imagination ends. We're developing um, uh, natural pastures up here. This isn't no hobby. This is, a, this, is, this is just a restoration of a lifestyle that's happened here before. So she believes that the return of the buffalo will help weave back together the ancient fabric of Pueblo life. All our trail, main trails from here go into the easterly direction. We have mountain pass and just right up here about another 20 miles is where the Santa de Cristos drop sharply and that's where begins the plains area. And this is every time we needed to take refuge from the Spanish intrusion from the south, we always headed east. And this is how we were able to interact with our Kiowa and our Comanche brothers. And a lot of the ceremonies and buffalo dance songs are explaining this in detail on how to get through the mountains and into the buffalo plains. For a hundred years, long after the last wild herds had been slaughtered, Pueblo dancers kept up a lonely, sacred vigil. An 
now as a young boy, uh, our culture just about died out. Uh, one year uh, for our annual feast day, which is on the 4th of October, uh, another Pueblo had to come and dance for us. I guess they didn't have to, but they were, they were uh, had uh, Nambe blood in them, so they felt that it should continue. And I must have been uh, uh, eight or 10 maybe. And I felt embarrassed that somebody else had to come and do it for us. Over the last two years, the Intertribal Bison Cooperative has helped an alliance of northern New Mexico Pueblos, including Picarese, Nambe, Pohaki, San Juan, and San Aldefonso, start their own bison herds. The day the buffalo were brought in was on the 30th of December last year, just about the term of my, the end of the term of my governorship. And, and uh, I think just about everybody from the Pueblo that went up to to greet them when they came had tears in their eyes. I know I choked up. All the kids come out, kindergarten, head start. They walk up here in, in the mornings with their teachers, come up to see us feed them. Seen a lot of people coming out and wanting to dance buffalo now compared to what we'd have to go out and ask people to dance now. All the little kids are going around singing and dancing buffalo at their uh, schoolyards. So by bringing back these buffaloes, it's, it's like a breath of fresh air, it's renewal. Like I said, it's a watering the seed. That's something to believe in, that's faith. You know, that's something to say, hey, this is, this is real, you know. Uh, um, I'm not just looking at a book and reading about our history. This, it's happening right now, and I am part of that history. The joy in the Pueblos is tempered by the realization that these animals cannot be kept in a corral or fed from a bag for very long. For their own health, these buffalo must be moved quickly into a nearby 600-acre pasture that has not yet been fenced. It is the simple, unglamorous costs, like fencing, that casts a shadow over the enthusiasm. It is nearby Taos that hovers sweetly in the imagination of the smaller pueblos. With its sparkling streams and high mountain pastures, Taos has supported a tribal herd of 200 since the 1930s. They say this entire valley from mountain peak to mountain peak used to be uh, luscious grazing land. But when they brought sheep into this area, the sheep tend to eat everything down to the root and then kill it. And it was replaced by um, sagebrush because of the uh, low moisture. With the blessing of the tribal leadership, and the technical support of the cooperative, Taos now plans to expand its herd and move it to a stunning 5,000-acre pasture on the rim of the Rio Grande Gorge. And using current methods of uh, holistic range management, you can turn that sagebrush into mulch and let the natural grasses take over. And amongst those native grasses, we're hoping that we'll have some of the medicinal plants that will be used by the bison to cure themselves, take care of themselves, and it's by eating this meat that we also take care of ourselves. You are what you eat. It's a message that Louis LaRose has taken back to the Winnebago of Nebraska. One of the major things that we're looking at in our project is, is a diabetic, or, or diet, and it relates to diabetics, because we're finding that in the, traditionally we didn't have diabetes in the tribe. And when we look back at the native diets, uh, it's with the, it's, it's the post-treaty diets that's caused uh, so many problems for Indian people, and we were looking at providing uh, an al a substitute food, and we're finding that returning back to the native diet is the best thing that we can come up with. In in order for us to consider buffalo as as a healthy food for for us as human beings, we also need to look at uh, a healthy diet for the buffalo. And the healthy diet for the buffalo was, was native grasses and native prairie, and they seem to thrive very well. So we have to take a look at, at how we can change the system back so that we can provide a, a healthy ecosystem for the, for the buffalo. But it also equates to a healthy ecosystem for all of the, the other animals that were here. When you have animals and plants that have evolved together for thousands of years, they, they form an interdependence on each other. 
the same as I'm talking about with our people in these buffalo. We form that same kind of interdependence uh, over the years also. So we're part of that. And that comes from our ancestors being buried here, turning back into the earth. The plants grow out of that. These guys eat that. We eat them. It just it comes around full circle. And it's, that's what causes that interdependence. And we all become related through that process. You know, the old people, spiritual people, everybody in prayer says, Madaki Oyasi. That means all my relatives. I recognize all my relatives. Sometimes people scoff at that, you know. Oh, this guy thinks this buffalo is his brother, or this coyote's his cousin, or, you know, whatever. But it's true. The restoration of buffalo culture has unleashed the hidden wisdom of tribal elders, many of whom are the last living connection to traditional ways. A long time ago, our people used this animal. She calls them the four-legged. She said these are very sacred to us. And a long time ago, when we used, when we killed one, we used everything. She said nothing was ever wasted. During a recent workshop sponsored by the cooperative, Edna Little Elk, a grandmother from the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota, led a new generation through the traditional butchering of a buffalo. You know, they call it he hunt ha hampe. Chante and he hunt ha hampe. This is the heart, and there's little pieces right here. Those little Most of these children had never seen a buffalo before Fred Dubray offered his vision of a new future. Today, the Cheyenne River herd is almost a thousand, and the children are surrounded by the lessons of buffalo culture. When we pray, we pray for everything. Okay, if we if we're gonna go for, if we're gonna go hunting, say a, a hunting party, gonna go hunting, we don't just pick up our bow and arrow or guns or whatever, and just go right out and shoot some animal and bring it back. We pray for the animal. We try to tell our children. Don't just go pick up uh, a weapon and go hunting. You have to pay, pray for what you're going to get. In the far north plains of Montana, the Grovaw and Assiniboine tribes of the Fort Belknap Reservation have built a herd of 200. Periodically, they call the herd, and on each occasion, tribal members gather to pray. The reason that we do the pipe ceremony is to show respect and to thank him for providing for us again. 10 years ago, or 20 years ago, before the buffalo, we got what buffalo we had back. Uh, there was never that type of pipe ceremony thanking the buffalo for, for providing for us. If not, we'll take, see that one straight ahead? Yeah. That might be one right there. There's, a, there's kind of the bigger one, is behind. Well, there's one behind. Born on the plains, right there. free on the plains, shot on the plains. These animals will never have their horns cut off, be shot up with antibiotics, or be force-fed in a feedlot. The meat is distributed at tribal powwows and sun dances. Even the guts will be used. The tail is coveted by an elder who uses it to splash hot rocks with water during swat ceremonies. The skull will be painted by a local artist. The hide will be tanned and distributed by the tribe. The Grovaw and Assiniboine are among several cooperative members who look upon their herds as a source of economic development. Right. Yeah, we should be, should be able to get up to 300 adults producing 150 cows with at least, uh, you take uh, out of 150 calves, you take out 30 to start new, ranch, new ranchers plus the uh, powwows. And that still leaves either a live uh, on the hoof market for 120 animals, or hopefully we'll get into the retail meat business here. We could have gone on, but probably not at the pace that we've, uh, we've uh, went so far. I mean, with uh, ITBC, I think we've done more in three, three years than they did in the last 15, uh, both with uh, technical expertise uh, and just some of the vision from uh, the other tribe, uh, the other uh, ITBC members, and also with the funding sources, we'd have never been able to build our corrals. Uh, it would have been a lot harder to get the money to expand this pasture. Even the new 6,000-acre pasture the Grove on Assiniboine will fence this year is just a whisper of the vision. On the solitary plains of the Fort Belknap Reservation, Mike Fox believes there are more than 400,000 acres 
that could be used for buffalo restoration. Even though expanding buffalo herds promised to be a successful business venture for the tribes, Fred Dubray offers a note of caution. The only way that we can justify doing this is to allow them to be what they are. We can't try to change them. We can't try to influence the way that they're going to come back. We can't try to tinker with their genes and make them into this super buffalo that it's got these great big hind quarters so they produce more meat. I mean, we've already made all those mistakes with cattle and other domestic livestock. I guess a real good way to explain that is the same governmental approach to Indian people. They said, well, we don't really want to kill all these Indians, but if we can make them into white people, then it'd be a pretty good deal. So that's what they pursued. That's what they tried to do. And it didn't work. That was a real, uh, real big mistake. In an effort to bind the tribes to a common vision, Rocky Afraid of Hawk offered the tradition of the staff. Well, the staff, <clears throat> in the beginning, was just a, just a plain stick, but it had a purpose. There's, I guess it was made for the, the strength of the ITBC. To hold a staff and pray, all the members from the different tribe that come and hold a staff, they're committing themselves, they're committing their life in working with the buffalo to bring them back. And every feather here represents one of the tribes of this whole nation. This is part of three tribes, Nambe, San Juan, San Alfonso, and Buffalo. Keep them well. Today, 36 feathers hang from the cooperative staff, and more are added at each board meeting. We can't ever forget the meaning of what this staff means, like Rocky and Carl and Richard have just spoken about. It's a real deep commitment. It represents each one of these tribes committing themselves to restoring these buffalo. And that's a great undertaking that we've taken on. There's a lot of responsibility goes with that. There's, a, uh, there's gonna be a lot of obstacles standing in our way. And this represents the unity. And we're gonna need each other's strength to draw from as we go and as we move forward. And that's what the power of this staff represents. There's no reason to try to say this should just be a Cheyenne River thing. It should just be a Lakota thing or it should just be a any tribal thing because we all share a common relationship and a common bond. And we all need each other's support in order to bring them back. And just like they need us to help them out. You know, Cheyenne River alone couldn't go up and stand up to Congress and say, we need to do this. This is a real important undertaking they wouldn't even hear us. They'd just probably close the door in our face. But if we've got 34 tribes or 38 tribes saying the same thing, they still might close the door in our face, but at least they're going to hear us. In just three years, tribal herds on the plains have grown dramatically. Seven new herds have been formed. Existing herds have tripled in size, and 25,000 acres have been committed to buffalo restoration. Board meetings are often spent surveying the growth of herds, exchanging thoughts on genetic variation, or admiring new corral facilities. But the heart of the cooperative will always be the way the tribes think about the land, the buffalo, and the unity of life. When we meet, like Rocky talked about that staff, we put that staff in the center of, what, of everything we're doing. And there's a tie to that also and you become committed to that organization of uh, helping each other. So it goes way beyond what you're trying to do for yourself, even for your own tribe. You realize that they really need the help. They're in a bad way. It's easy for us to understand that because we need that kind of help ourselves from each other. So we kind of feel like we're in the same boat together. The Buffalo Nation, we need you. We're depending on you. Buffalo Nation, we're depending on you again. Today is a sacred day. So, Grandfather, hear my prayers.
Hello, no more.